floor is yours, Gottfried Wagner. Dear Raymond, dear Eric, dear colleagues, thank you very much for the invitation. I have to confess it uh, costed me some sleepless hours and some sleepless nights, uh, given the authority and also the personal knowledge about Raymond and what he has achieved. And to put this in perspective with our current European project and the role of foundations seemed to be almost too much to, um, to deliver um, a lecture. So I decided to, not to call it lecture, but <clears throat> some thoughts. I'm, uh, in a way, I'm an emeritus now in the foundation world, so you will forgive me that I will be um, critical at some moments. I do it from a firm position of loyalty vis-a-vis -vis the foundations I have seen too much of what you and we can achieve in our world, but I think at certain moments the challenges are great and we need to find maybe new answers to it. Uh, Raymond has been a very courageous man in finding very, very strong answers to difficult situations. So, um, Raymond allegedly never had sleepless nights. And this is the greatest piece of respect. How did you achieve that? What, looking at... No pills. <laughs> when you just sum up what he had founded, institutions, programs, uh, one of the largest European scheme for young people, Erasmus, how could he have done without having sleepless nights? His, the foundation, the European Cultural Foundation, where I had the honor to serve as one of the successors of Raymond, was a small foundation in the Netherlands. Suddenly they had 100 people working on the Erasmus program. It's just incredible. So you probably all know this book about Raymond. It's called The Quiet European Gardener and about this wonderful man, Mr. Raymond Juris. When I read it again, I had two main sentiments, feelings, reactions. One was an endless respect for your skills and for your integrity. And the second was that I was taken by surprise that actually you have been at certain moments very radical, almost revolutionary. And I would like to give you two examples, two Quotes, there were moments when he was very critical about foundations and then he used words like, outspoken words like, uh, lack of transparency, walls of silence even. And in terms of revolutionary and uh, his approaches to Europe, he said, foundations are handicapped by their national status, while Europe, he said, is providing an umbrella enabling nation states to eventually disappear. Try to say that your colleagues at home, the politicians at home, they would think you're mad, but I think it is, it is the direction which you have indicated, but you did it in a very, very outspoken and very daring way. Well, here we are in the midst of my topic tonight. I will make a strong plea for more Europe more smart Europe in the spirit of Raymond to overcome the crisis instead of more national or nationalistic bargaining. And I would like to uh, think about the role of foundations in this more Europe process. Uh, as a former director of the European Cultural Foundation, one of the very few truly European foundations in, in, in this, on this continent, I ultimately love to quote Raymond's imperative, build networks of foundations who would partner in projects important to the process of European unification. The message couldn't be clearer and more challenging. Indeed, your vision, Raymond's vision, was to be more political than philanthropic, as the authors of the book and he himself said. We cannot complain about the absence of risks today. But even in the view of the persistent unresolved crisis of Europe, 
the gardener Raymond refuses a Voltaire's resignation when Candide, the character of this famous novel, concluded ultimately, il faut cultiver son jardin. This resignation was never Raymond's part. On the contrary, there was a firm commitment for courage. Last time, when I was invited to address the EFC assembly, it was in Budapest, as uh, Eric said, in 2005, shortly after the failed referenda on the constitution in France, in the Netherlands. Another deep crisis, yet definitely less existential than the crisis of today. When being invited again for this occasion, I thought, my dear, uh, pocket Cassandra Gottfried is asked again to assess the situation. And then, in order to go further than just a déjà vu, I scrutinized my thoughts of 2005. And I must admit, in the end, we were not very successful in changing the overall situation. In 2005, I had tried to argue that next to economic efficiency, we wouldn't succeed in building a complex Europe in a satisfactory way, if we wouldn't understand the need for, in a wider sense, a cultural project Europe. I presented a plea for this cultural project Europe which would strive for a new political culture in Europe. Against the backdrop of the crunch of the EU as a project of the elites. But I went further, I said, aren't you, aren't we foundations part of these elites? And are we then unwillingly, or have we been un unwillingly part of the failure as well? I called then in 2005 for a new responsibility of European foundations to jointly invest in new fundaments for this Cultural Project Europe, building on shared European public and republic space and supporting visionary leadership but also developing policies for culture in partnership with the European institutions. Here again, Raymond's contribution in partnering with European institutions had as one of the strongest results this Erasmus program. I'm afraid the plea for the Cultural Project Europe proved rather to be a vain hope. Political culture has even more deteriorated, hasn't it? And as regards a possible non-elitist campaign of, in principle, elitist foundations for shared trust in Europe, I'm not sure whether they have taken a more united and a more powerful stance. And I think Raymond would agree. Sure, there have been projects and good ones, but probably a substantial impact was hard to achieve, if not rare, measured against the magnitude of the challenge. Why? Partly due to the limited space for non-local, non-regional, non-national cooperative action in the very statutes of foundations. As long as they are read like being carved in stone, no matter how the environment evolves. In 2005, after these two failed referenda, I said, citizens have pulled the emergency brake vis-a-vis -vis the European unification process. And I quoted Dutch people saying, the train was running too fast, too far, and nobody knew the destination. Then came the Nice Treaty, a tool only, not a constitution. For sure, as we see now, not robust enough for tackling the 2008 financial crisis. Power migrated back in an uncontrolled way to member states, or to be more precisely, to a few member states, a few big member states. And in the end, we are still and again facing a massive economic, but also political and cultural crisis. Remember Raymond saying, Europe is providing an umbrella enabling nation states to eventually disappear? We are far from that. 
rereading my Philippica of Budapest, I conclude that failure has become more dangerous nowadays. And um, I found it, to conclude this first part, useful to quote two sentences out of this 2005 speech. I said, the coming decade will be char characterized by an ever more cutthroat level of competition between global players as well as between the rich, less rich, and the very poor member states. And I was speaking about splits in society, referring to impoverishment and unemployment. Spare me, please, to recall today's horrifying figures from Spain, Greece, or Portugal. Nightmares. Europe is not an affair of our heart, I said then, nor do people believe that it delivers. It may be worse today. And this leads me to my second part. Dear colleagues, we did not manage to make democracy more flexible and resilient. We did not manage to balance the social and economic project. We did not balance the markets and the public responsibilities, freedom and equality, Europe and globalization. Mind you, this we that failed does not mean politicians only, or business leaders, or academia researchers. It includes us, the foundations, as well. However, you have not invited me probably to um, spread fatalism. And most of us don't see a complete void of, of perspectives. On the contrary, I'll try to be self-provokingly positive today in the spirit of Raymond and call for some action. I dare so face, facing the risk that in another seven years from now you would see me giving up with not much more than an ultimate shrug. Hence, two, more more, uh, two main points, one on policy in Europe and the second on foundations, on policy. We don't have a chance, let's grasp it. But there are two approaches to that. Vis-a-vis -vis this poisoning complexity and incalculable uh, dangers of today's economic political crisis, it seems like we don't know anything really about lasting solutions. We apparently have no clue how to overcome the crisis. In particular, the financial crisis, says the skeptical pessimist. This is not true, says the cautious optimist. In fact, we do know already quite a lot, enough to move on to safer grounds, and there's more tacit agreement amongst stakeholders than visible on the surface. Moreover, the knowledge we share is growing thanks to a remarkable collective learning process from the island Great Britain to Eastern Europe stupendously growing consensus echoes that we need to act now and to engineer the critical tools to set positive change in motion in the midst of the struggles of interests and particularities. Here the role of foundations uh, comes in with their capacity for pioneering, creative kickstarting, launching unorthodox ideas, the famous leverage. But what about the content of this change? Of course, the time is very limited here to go deep, but I want to, sh to, to, to describe some of the shapes of the solutions which are shared amongst uh, a community of experts. What are those shapes of possible consensus? Firstly, there's much agreement based on analysis and public debate that fund the fundamental key for change lies in a smart transformation of our economic system. As the fundamental key for change lies in the transformation of our economic system and the undoubted necessity to transform its governance. It is about new balances, about re-strengthening public policies, also in the interest of healthier financial markets. It's about limiting risks and limit excessive gambling. 
It's about regaining more fairness and equality in distribution, if, even if only uh, for macroeconomic reasons, for cynics. It's about redefining and reaching new models of growth. It's about proper transnational governance, structures related to common economic and currency areas. Whether we call it transformation of capitalism or not, a vast majority shares the basic agenda for change. A majority of qualified experts would agree on a number, a quite impressive number, of basic demands for change. I count it, I, count, it's, I think it's somewhere around the number of 10 major keys for changing this, or for reaching this transformation. The difficulty is not the knowledge, it's the way to implement it today. How to win the battle against particular interests. The second challenge is the transformation of our democratic system, of our democratic governance in Europe from national to transnational participation and control. Again, I believe firmly that there are a number of demands where, we, where many would agree. They reach from further empowering the European Parliament to more elements of direct democracy. They go to more direct voting as regards the executive, the commission, its president and its control, while limiting the power of member states to block decisions, say, for example, in security issues. Of course, that has to be seen in a combination with, a more, with more flexibility in forming partial alliances in certain matters. There are issues that need cautious negotiation and communication, for example, EU-wide social standards or fiscal governance for shared economic areas. And finally, enlightened democratic leadership is required, and we all know that the choice of the best for Brussels has to improve. In a nutshell, democracy has to be extended and transformed as well. Whether this needs a new convention, like in 2000, planned in 2005 or not, will be one of the major issues in the coming months. But whether there will be a convention or not, it will be a very, very important process where I think foundations have to play a, a very important role. Thirdly, transformation also concerns our stance on globalization. Europe needs to develop proactively a very much stronger power and cloud to shape globalization in its own interest, but also for the common good in a cosmopolitan spirit. If I would have to summarize these three uh, needs for transformation, I would say it's about one word, it's about and. What I mean is we are not good enough in being competitive in, in Europe, and we are not good enough in cooperation. So my plea is we have to develop in the next years both abilities to compete successfully and to cooperate for the common good. Second, the role of foundations in this context. Let me first recall another lesson from Raymond's um, practice and that is a twofold advice. I think reading him carefully indeed calls for radical thinking, but at the same time, and this is what we know about you, he was a master in communication and modesty, transforming mindsets of people through talking, hu having humor, being not on the center stage, leaving space for others. This skill of communication together with the radicality of analysis. I think that was part of the, of the magic. Raymond's European confession was always very clear. Today, a similar courage of this gardener is needed even more. Foundations cannot, I think, approach this fundamental challenge through philanthropy only, but as potentially influential political animals. 
intelligently and freely reasoning stakeholders of the public good. One important part of this ability to uh, become political is the self-reflectiveness of foundations. And here, I'm afraid, um, I have to say something which comes to me since I'm not any longer a uh, member of the foundation world, but uh, coming also from the public side and uh, citizens, uh, concerned citizens' voices. The self-reflectiveness of foundations today would entail that it is not sufficient to repeat that foundations always strive for change without saying precisely what change means today in Europe. Change starts with listening to most critical reflections and unmistakable provocations even. For example, one quote, foundations have, or the foundations world, has arrived in the eye of the storm. Its name is capitalism, or however you call it, with its enormous achievements, including foundations, but also its enormous risks, if not subordinated to democratic rationales. For the third, the civic sector, it is detrimental to neglect that citizens today often associate foundations dangerously closely with the whole package crisis, a uh, crisis package, sorry. Whether justified or not, they discuss the role of private wealth, private acquisition of profit, and unjustified public distribution of losses, uncontrolled investment strategies, in short, whether the market has overruled public decision making to a dysfunctional degree, the financial markets in particular, that are seen more as a lottery than ruled by the famous invisible hand. This critique is of course not new. Some major fortunes on which foundations endowments are based have been perceived by many uh, as uh, stemming from questionable business, for example, speculation against currencies. Yet, the case of foundations as such had never been discussed with fundamental distrust. One reason being that foundations um, have looked and searched and fought for rules, standards, statutes, including standard setting European foundation statutes. However, dangers today are bigger. It does not ease the suspicion of citizens that paradoxically foundations themselves and their beneficiaries have become victims of the volatility of the market. Many have. Foundations are tested against principles, not only of transparency, but also much broader in terms of the balance between the public and the private interest. It is thus not any longer only about the classic management of risk, and it's not any longer about uh, organizational issues. It is about rethinking our DNA. And the question of today is, what does it mean to use private wealth for the public good in view of this enormous financial crisis? What to do? In their own interest, foundations should contribute with all their independence to a European process of regenerating the common good. This is my kind of the essential sentence. To contribute with all their independence to the regenerating of the common good in Europe. What is needed? Impact, sustainability, and leverage. Projects are not enough. We need a three to five years massive alliance building and investment. Sustainability and uh, vanguard and incubating European solutions. The content of the activities, which how I see it, would focus on three levels. One would be transformation of our economic system. The second is support for uh, uh, related democratic transformation, and the third, global governance. What can we do? What can you do? I think there is a need for public debate and research. Secondly, there is need for related practice which needs support, but it has to be very explicit 
European. And thirdly, what is needed is advocacy for this European project. A whole range of projects and programs need to be designed, initiatives supported, stimulated, launched. These strategies will have internal dimensions, the market, our democracy, but also external uh, dimensions, telling the narratives of what has been achieved in this continent, on this continent and what is still to be reached and weaving the textures for narratives of the future as the first ever voluntary transnational community that enters new relations with the world. And uh, to be very practical, I think the new constitutional process, which is now in the consideration, in the making slowly, will demand huge amounts of collective energies. Citizens will have to be supported and included in this upcoming process of improving the constitutional basis or the transformation of our transnational democracy. And institutions and leaders should know that foundations are partners on this path for transformation. Europe is trying to enhance, improve its clout on international relations, on globalization. And we know this entails strong external policies as well. Policies that by nature in the European case also need to build very strongly on public diplomacy and soft power policies, including culture. I'm saying that because one of my hobby horses is to advise an initiative which is called More Europe Culture and External Relations. You can get some material outside. But what I find so important is that we uh, see that our role in the world needs to be shaped by soft issues very strongly and foundations. I couldn't imagine better partners to uh, help the uh, international community and the European institutions to develop that. Concluding. <laughs> I think you all do fantastic work at home and we've seen that in the, in the discussions in the panels before. I think what is needed is not a revolution forever, but it, it would be a pact for three to five years where you would complement your good action at home and to make a very special and very serious effort to take collectively or in alliances and coalitions, depending on the interests, a strong political stance for the next couple of years, which need to be decisive. <laughs> Nobody expects the European Foundation Center and its members to reinvent capitalism or democracy. Raymond's Homeric laughter would be heard even across the English Channel. Yet, it can, on the other hand, be damaging if business as usual, as successful as it may be, will be continued as if nothing had happened around us. Sometimes I have the feeling that the safe, safest way for grand old institutions, including foundations, is to continue doing things which they are good in and uh, not really looking at uh, dramatically changed environment changes. It, and that, I think, really can be damaging, even for the foundations. It is not enough to have a purely unionist position, enabling the legal and fiscal environment, documenting the foundation's landscape. It will not be sufficient to uh, focus on practical organizational goals, like building the capacity of foundation's professionals, however necessary this is if disengaged from the political context. I quote your leaflet on the Belfast um, Assembly. Collaboration among foundations and between foundations and other actors is there advised. Yes, full-heartedly support that. It, I would add it needs a stubborn Europeanization for a limited period of time, more decisive than 
and not only through case-by-case -case projects, by arbitrary coalition building. This big question then, the last one, is can foundations gradually overcome what Raymond called the handicap of their national status? The answer could be, for me at least, it's clear that Europe needs a step change or it risks decline. And foundations <laughs> are decisive stakeholders. Why? They can secure liberal and rational complementarities to state and market strategies. And then, again, the question, can this independent third sector free enough capacities to help shaping this new Europe? And I think the debate starts at home in each and every board of the foundations, the debate on the mandate of the foundations, and a possible adapt adaptation, adjustment, facing the risks for a limited period of time. How best to get involved substantially against the tides of retro nationalism and decline. It may help to define this agenda for a limited number of years to unite and deploy more forces in a European laboratory. Raymond, recalling what you have been dreaming about without sleepless nights and how you transformed vision into tangible programs uh, makes our task, if we study your model and your experience, a little bit easier. It is possible. And after all, taking into account your communicational skills and your never-ending humor. I would like to close this with a special warm thanks to you, Raymond. Merci. Thank you. Bedankt. Von harte bedankt. Thank you very much.